Welcome to Forests, Folklore, and Fantasy. I am Kelly Rice, but I write and publish under my pen name, K.M. Rice. Wherever you are, I hope that this episode finds you doing well, dear listener. Today, we are going to explore the roots of the holiday we now know as Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day occurs on the 14th of February, and I should note that I am going to be focusing on traditions that occur in the Northern Hemisphere, because like most Indigenous European holidays, this one um, obviously took place in the Northern Hemisphere. Like most extant holidays, we know Valentine's Day through its Christian name because it was, I hesitate to say a Christianized holiday, but definitely merged with a celebration of a Christian martyr. And that would be, of course, St. Valentine. And we'll learn a little bit more about that um, today. But Valentine's Day has been many different things over the centuries. It's potentially a survival of an incredibly ancient holiday that maybe even predated the Greeks. Um, We're a little foggy on the details about that, but that's just based on some archaeological excavations. Um, So I'll start with giving you a broad overview, which is that by and large, the traditions that have to do with the holiday we now know as Valentine's Day, have always centered around the concepts of fertility, of the transition of spring, and of a sense of purification that comes hand in hand with the changing of the seasons. So the the cleansing nature of the winter washing away and spring emerging and hopefully new life emerging as well. This may sound a little similar to In Bulk, for those of you who listened to my episode providing an overview of In Bulk. Uh, And there is a possibility that these holidays, or at least the customs surrounding them, have have commingled over time and have merged and danced and separated and gone different directions over time. And we see that a lot with folk traditions and folk holidays. Um, it's just human nature to change things and to adapt things and to borrow things. So um, you'll definitely see that in the history behind this this holiday as well. Of course, we now know Valentine's Day as a celebration of romantic love. And in our culture, that's as close, really, as we get to celebrating fertility in any way, it's it's celebrating this fairly modern idea of romantic love existing between two people for there is any sort of act that produces progeny. I mean, at least here in the States, we were founded by an influence by Puritan culture. And so, of course, there are reasons for not perhaps overtly linking some of these customs to fertility rights. Uh, But that's something that we don't really need to get too deep into. Just understand that if you pull back the veneer a little bit, especially with something as commercialized, right, as Valentine's Day, something that's been so shaped by, uh, not only by capitalism, but by materialism. But I think it's really neat to know that there is this deep, deep ancient connection to much older customs and this deep connection with this holiday that on the surface seems like it was made up by corporations to sell greeting cards and chocolate and flowers uh, to a very primal desire to once again, feel like we have some influence or sway or control over our destinies, over our health, 
over our ability to bear children, over the turning of the seasons. The earliest potential candidate to be an ancestor holiday of Valentine's Day was likely the Lycaea Greek festival. Uh, it was an archaic festival in celebration of a place called Mount Lycaon or Wolf Mountain. And there are a lot of different myths surrounding this location. While we do know that in this area there was a festival that had to do with a founding myth, some human sacrifice, and the god Zeus, who was one of the, um, or is rather, the father of most of the gods in the Greek pantheon, there is evidence that traditions have been held on this mountainside or this mountain summit for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, even though there are stories to do with human sacrifice, it more seems to be a fear. And a lot of the rituals were essentially warding or protecting their society against the fear of cannibalism. Uh, and yet, just, just to be clear, uh, we have not found any archaeological evidence in the refuse. There's a great ash heap in this area where other types of sacrifices were happening, so other animals were being sacrificed to the gods, and I ap apparently ritually burned. And um, we have not found any evidence of humans actually being sacrificed. But it's a terrifying idea, and uh, it's understanding that people are wanting to protect themselves, again, try to control their fate in some way by enacting a ritual to protect them from that. So there is evidence that this site has been used since the third millennium before the common era, which for context is at least a thousand years before the concept of Zeus became something to be venerated and celebrated. Uh, so that, that, that's pretty, to me, that's pretty mind blowing that Valentine's day or the holiday that we now know as Valentine's day. And again, these aren't clear lines that we can trace throughout history, but there's a suggestion that in one of its many forms, it was once Lycaea. At some point in time, in this area of Greece, a sanctuary of Pan, the god Pan, was created. So Pan is a figure that most of you have probably seen before. He is half human or young man or boy from the torso up, often has horns and perhaps goat's ears, and then is goat from the waist to down. He plays a set of pipes. His name survives in several English words, including panic and pandemonium. So as you can imagine, he's a god of chaos, more or less. He's a mischief maker and he's an interferer. So there's a tradition that tells of a man named Evander who led a colony from Arcadia in Greece into Italy, what is now Italy, the Pen Italic Peninsula, and founded a town called Palantion on the Palatine, which later became the Roman Forum, essentially the heart of Rome. So again, this is a foundation myth, I'll call it. Uh, and he brought this concept of Pan, or Pan Lycaeus, so this wolfish Pan, with him. And that, at some point, melded with a later holiday, 
or festival called Lupercalia, which we will get to in a moment. Pan's strongest link to this time of year, which, by the way, we don't know if Lycalia was celebrated specifically this time of year. In fact, there's some evidence that it might have been later in the spring. Um, but Pan is associated with this time of year because he he was a, a partier. He was often hanging out with a bunch of beautiful female nymphs, and he's very much associated with male virility and male sexuality and just sex in general. And because of that, he has this strong connection to springtime, which, as most people know, is the time when seeds are germinating and when animals are I shouldn't say animals because that's actually not very true. <laughs> when birds in particular, which have always been very observable uh, to humans, even after we began living in civilizations, birds begin to seek mates and to find mates and to build nests and to procreate. So I would say it actually has a lot more to do with birds than it does necessarily with other animals. However, other animals do give birth quite often in the spring because it's much easier to rear your young in the warmer months than it is in the colder months. So those are the obvious links to fertility and to rebirth and to the vitality of life associated with pan and with intercourse and with the changing seasons. So I know I said pan is associated with chaos too he's also associated with the wild with woodlands with that side of nature that we can't ever really tap into and understand and yet he's half human and he's also half domesticated animal so in a lot of ways he's one of these bridging deities where you have the human representing civilization and then uh the domestic animal upon which we rely for sustenance, which itself is a bit of a in-between creature, right? A bit of a liminal creature. And then the wilds where he dwells. So he's very much this blend of a lot of different concepts. And I think that's important to understand how he became associated with Lupercalia, because as the name suggests, it was another celebration of the wolf. But not just any wolf. Bupercalia was a celebration of one wolf in particular. If you don't know the story of the founding of Rome, which, by the way, was, I guess I'll just say created, many centuries after Rome was an established city and civilization. Um, so it's it's an example of Again, telling a foundation myth long after uh, people have already occupied a space and already been in an area. And perhaps it's because they've lost the oral history of where they came from and have what seems to me an incredibly innate human yearning to tap into that and to understand that and to understand why are we here and where do we come from and who, who are my people? Who were my ancestors? Um, another great literary example of this that survives is Ovid or Ovid's Aeneid, which is another foundation myth of Rome long after the Greek civilization rose and fell and was becoming romanticized. Um, many scholars believe that the Iliad was still very much circulated in Rome. That's the account of the Greek and Trojan War and was so romanticized and so beloved that the Romans wanted to know that they had some part in the tale. Um, and so that birthed the Aeneid. Um, but that's a little beyond the scope of, of today's conversation. So the quick 
very quick and dirty story of the Romulus and Remus Foundation of Rome is that they were born and deemed to be, they were twin boys. They were deemed to be a threat by a local king. And so he had them exiled. It's very common, sadly, in Greek and Roman myths to have tales of child exposure. In fact, it's a whole category of of myths um, where the children were just abandoned out in the wilds and abandoned to their fate because someone didn't want to do the dirty work of actually murdering the child. I mean, who can blame them? And they would abandon them to expose them to the elements. And usually what happens in these stories is that someone else or something else comes along. So this king in some versions of the story had ordered for these twin boys to be drowned and just gotten rid of so that they would never be his rivals. And instead, they were left out. And who found them but a wolf? A female wolf. They call her a she-wolf. Which I'm not 100% clear on because a wolf is a wolf. Why do you have to identify that's a she-wolf? But anyhow. So she suckled and raised these two boys. And the cave in which she allegedly did this was also located on Palatine Hill, which, again, is the heart of the Roman Forum, the heart of Rome itself. So the Romans really enjoyed this concept of being linked to an animal as beautiful and majestic and fearsome as the European wolf and believing that there was some aspect of that in their lineage. Sadly for Remus, there is some fratricide in the story. Um, I won't go into the details, but Romulus ends up in charge. Hence the name Rome comes from Romulus because he likewise offed his brother. And, um, you know, some have speculated that the Romans have this very violent origin story as a justification for their violence, the violence and conquest that they committed around much of their realm of influence, around much of Europe and Africa and parts of Asia. But the reality or the more likely scenario is since we know that this was created as a foundation myth after the civilization had already been thriving for centuries, the story is violent because their culture and their society was violent. Thankfully, while there is a little bit of violence in the festival of Lupercalia, it isn't intended to venerate that. Instead, Romulus's wolfish origins are celebrated, and the she-wolf herself was celebrated. So ancient sources claim that there were priests known as Luperci, or the Brotherhood of the Wolf. I could be mispronouncing that. It could be Luperci, but uh, it's... You know, I never said this in my About Me. I talked about learning Anglo-Saxon or Old English. I also studied Latin, but I was doing it at the same time as Anglo-Saxon and Old English. So my advice that's like a joke to me, but nobody else gets it because no one else is this much of a nerd. My advice is if you're going to learn a dead language, don't try to learn two at once. But the Luperci would... Uh, perform certain rituals at Lupercalia that, to me, very disturbingly involved the sacrifice of a dog and a goat. So this, the goat aspect, and potentially the dog, because dogs could be um, justifiably seen as another bridging uh, concept of the wild, so the wolf to the dog to our companions, our helpers, our hunters, um, animals that aid us in a bet civilization. Um, and then, of course, the goat, potentially, 
being once again linked to Pan. Um, so there is a lot of strong evidence that what was once a very ancient Greek festival or celebration of sorts migrated and transformed into um, this cel celebration of, of Romulus. So after these animals were sacrificed, strips from the goat's hide would be cut and these priests, these uh, these would run a loop, run a circuit from wherever their temple was in Palatine Hill. And have these probably bloodied strips of goat hide and use them to flog people who showed expressed interest in wanting to participate by making sure they were in the way of these guys or holding out their hands or some accounts say their other ends and um usually it was women usually it was women and it didn't matter their stature or their status highborn women also took place uh, or took part rather in this festival and they would hold out their hands to be slapped or flogged or they would be spanked by these priests with this bloodied piece of goat hide and this was considered not only purification like a very purifying process but also it was considered to somehow help these women with their fertility the priests performing this were either completely naked or near naked. Um, so again, echoes of pan and pandemonium and engaging with our more animalistic sides and unleashing them and embracing them and harnessing them to our benefit for these women who put themselves in the way to be slapped and spanked wanted this to happen they either were pregnant and they wanted to be blessed for an easier childbirth or they were hoping to conceive the concept of slapping or flogging or spanking for fertility sounds really weird to most of us maybe not most of us i'm not going to go any further into that this is a clean podcast I'll let your imagination fill in the gap there with the word spanking. But it may seem bizarre to a lot of us. Um, but it was quite commonly documented in ancient customs. And my thinking behind that is because priests and shamans were viewed as people who were fully connected with the divine. And we tend to view them as conduits and a lot of our ancestral peoples viewed them as conduits as well. But also, many people believed that the god or the spirit climbed into that person for that period of time and therefore was that person for that period of time. And thus, the shaman or this priest would enter a spiritual frenzy. The act of slapping another in some way was seen seemed to imbue the recipient with some form of a blessing of, or, or power from this person who now has divinity flowing through them. And I'm old enough to have experienced this even in elementary school. Uh, this custom does survive. Do any of you remember or have any of you had this happen to you as a kid? Um, having a pinch on your birthday or a swat on your bum for your birthday or even just like a lovingly little swat on your bum um, we have these weird cultural artifacts that we don't understand why we're doing them or where they come from but that's an alleged origin for doing these things quote for luck like i'm gonna give you a pinch for luck or i'm gonna give you a little spank for luck and it is this again this concept that through a slap you are helping invigorate someone in some way, helping them with their health, helping them with their fertility. Um, and I don't know if that's because a swat really wakes you up 
it can really start getting your emotions going, right? It can get your anger going. So it does definitely feel enlivening. Uh, but those of you who took my um, Yuletide Keeping Old Christmas course will remember when we were talking about the custom of wassailing, which is, it can mean several different things. But one of them was the blessing of apple orchards while the trees are dormant. One of the things the people would do is swap the trunks of the trees with switches to drive away bad spirits, but also to encourage the tree's fertility and encourage the tree's new growth for the upcoming spring and its fruitfulness. Well, most of us aren't, you know, telling our sweethearts, you know what I'd really like for this Valentine's Day? A blood sacrifice. Or maybe, could you skin a goat and beat me with its hide? Um, most of us probably aren't thinking along those lines, thankfully, for the goats of the world. Um, but we do still see remnants of, of these sacrifices and fertility rites with the color red. There's a reason pretty much everything to do with Valentine's Day is either red or pink. Um, and that, again, is going back to blood. Blood being our life force. Blood being, therefore, the life force of the community. When you slaughter an animal and you consume it, you are taking its life and taking all of the nutrients and nutrition from its body and putting it into yours, sustaining your life. So that animal's blood is keeping you alive and obviously with the ritual like i just described for lupercalia in rome actual blood was involved um, animals were slaughtered or sacrificed to spill their blood as an offering so for many centuries there was and is a strong link between red and blood and fertility in the sense of one life was ended to boost your life. So I'm not trying to ruin that bouquet of red roses or that box of red chocolates that you may or may not receive and just providing a little bit of context. Another alleged part of Lupercalia was coupling. Um, Single young women's names were allegedly written down and placed into a vessel and drawn by young men. And, oh, I should say that the priests who were attempting to impart fertility and purification on the young women also were usually under 40. So they were relatively young men, again, going back to imbibing their vitality into these women. Um... But this, this next custom involves imbibing vitality in a different way. So young men would draw the name of a young lady from a vessel, and that would be their partner for the night. And they say that several of the couplings from Lupercalia would end in marriages. That's not to say these people fell in love, sadly. Um, women in ancient Rome had exceptionally low stature. Very, very few rights. So all we can do is just hope that the participants were willing to make us feel more comfortable as modern people, but the likelihood of that being true is sadly small. But again, this is a very strongly patriarchal culture, so that wouldn't really have been a concern of theirs if the woman was excited to be with this man or not. Really wouldn't have probably entered many people's minds because it just that was the norm thankfully forced couplings <laughs> are a thing of the past hopefully at least uh but when these young men would go to their young woman apparently it was also customary for them to bring a token or a gift and that very much survives obviously not just on Valentine's Day, but we still, in 
European societies or European influence societies like here in the United States have these customs of the male in a binary culture or binary gendered society, the male gifting a token of his respect or appreciation to the female, such as flowers or jewelry or chocolates. In the movies, they always do this like on a first date. Personally, I'd find that kind of creepy in this day and age. I'd be like, I don't, I don't even know you, dude. What are you doing? Um, but it is a well-established cultural custom. And that's something that, as we just saw, can also be traced back to Lupercalia. So there were actually two men named Valentine who were executed and martyred um, within the Roman Empire on or around February 14th. So the tales around which Valentine this was aren't certain, but the legend says that Emperor Claudius II executed a presbyter of of the church, of the Christian church, named Valentine around the year 269 of the Common Era. And the reason he executed him was because he was enraged to find out that Valentine was marrying Christian couples and allowing Christian couples to wed at that time, according to the tale, was illegal. And so this man was directly undermining the emperor and uh, performing these marriages. And this guy was so in love with love that even while he was locked up and in prison, he supposedly wrote a love note to the jailer's daughter. In some versions of this story, she was blind before that, and then his divine power as a healer or as a conduit, again, of the Christian God, so or Jesus, a conduit of the divine, restored her vision. So it's another example of the divine passing through a holy person as a blessing and going into an ordinary person and improving their life in some way. And supposedly this note that he wrote to her was signed, Your Valentine. So this day is still observed as a feast day by many Christian and Orthodox groups, but quite obviously that's where we originate our concept of having a Valentine, which is really sad. Um, I didn't hear specifics of how he knew the jailer's daughter, how he got to know her. Was this poor man desperate and just wanting to not be executed? And he's like, wait, actually, I'm in love with you. Or, I mean, this is silly speculation. Or was there actually a love story there? We don't know. It's a folktale that's had several different versions of it uh, passed around throughout the ages. But at the end of the day, it's a story about a man who sacrificed everything for romantic love. So now that we know that Valentine's Day ostensibly got its name from the romance-loving St. Valentine, um, I think it's important to say when it first appears in the, in the historical record. And that was in a work of literature by none other than Sir Geoffrey Chaucer, who some of you met in A Knight's Tale, but others of us us nerds who have English degrees, know as the author of the famous Canterbury Tales, which were written in Middle English. Uh, Middle English, when you look at it on the page, looks very bizarre. If you attempt to read it out loud, you start to understand what's being said and what's where, uh, how, how, how to actually pronounce the words, even though they're written and spelled very differently. Um, so he wrote a poem called A Parliament of Fowls, and he makes reference to Valentine's Day. He says, For this was 
on St. Valentine's Day, when every bird cometh there to choose his mate. I'm making that sound a little more like modern English than it actually does. Um, so that's the first documented time that we see the term Valentine's Day. Again, that was in 1482. And that tells us that if he is using that um, holiday as a reference point in a work of literature, that it is already embedded in the culture. That's already a cultural reference point that uh, his readers or listeners would be able to know and understand, which likely means that we can assume that this was a folk custom or holiday, at least going back into the Middle Ages. And you'll note that, as I said earlier, he's pointing out that the birds choose their mates. There are many different, <laughs> many different species of birds, and some of them, a relatively small group of them, do begin seeking mates this early in the spring. A lot of them wait until later in the spring, until it's warmer out, but several of them, obviously, as Chaucer observed, do begin looking for mates um, around this time of year, around early February, or mid-February, rather. And what I find really fascinating by this connection with birds is that birds, like humans, court. They court each other. Or at least we try to em emulate them. Um, a male, for most species, will do something to prove that he's worthy. The bird song puts us at ease for a lot of different reasons. It indicates to us that the area we're in is relatively safe. If the birds aren't afraid of a predator nearby, likely we don't have to be either. If they're singing and making noise and ignoring us, this is probably a healthy forest, um, a safe space. It's an instinctual, instinctual um, reckoning we have, an instinctual way of measuring our surroundings. And that's why I think we find birdsong very soothing, or at least one of the reasons we find birdsong to be very soothing. However, what's actually being communicated in those songs often is not soothing for the other birds. Often it is a song of territory saying, this is my space, don't you even think of coming here? Or it's a boastful song about, I am actually the greatest dude you've ever even heard of, and you should come check me out and see if I'm super great. And if he's lucky enough to get a female to come and be like, well, all right, how great are you? Uh, they'll often in enter into courtship rituals, and if she doesn't reciprocate, he's out of luck. If she does reciprocate, they often do, and this sounds familiar in humans, they often do ritualized, very specialized dances, ruffling of feathers, flashing of wings, flashing of their tail feathers, neck bobbing in different movements. And this part I find really fascinating as well. The males, and it's not just birds, insects do this as well. I started researching that and I completely have to admit that I got grossed out and creeped out by some of the stuff insects do. I won't get into it, but it involves bodily fluids and, like, parts of themselves being gifted. I don't know. The insect world's really alien to me. But birds, <laughs> birds are different. Male birds will often provide what is called a nupital gift, which is an offering uh, that has to have value in a very specific way. Usually, it is a high-value food that's going to add nutrition and sustenance to the female who of course is going to be sacrificing so much of her own nutrition and um, strength and parts of her body in order to create their young and so the male is coming forward and essentially acknowledging this and saying listen not only do I understand what I'm asking of you I'm going to do what I can to help you, and I just got you this fish or this insect 
or here's a really great tuft of moss that you can use to line the nest because we want the best for our kids and I don't want you to have to be expending the energy to go find that nesting material. Um, and that's a part of it too, is it's um, this concept of gifts as a sacrifice of some sort. The male bird is sacrificing his time and his energy and therefore his resources to find this nuptial gift for his potential mate. And often copulation will happen right after the gift's accepted. So it's like their code of, all right, you're going to be my husband. I mean, we don't really think of animals as husbands and wives, <laughs> but um, to put it in human terms, but the male providing this sustenance or material to build shelter in some way is also indicating that not only is he willing to help look after her while she's sitting on the eggs, but that he can help look after their young as well, that he can go out. He does know how to hunt. He does know how to survive. He will be able to um, co-parent. He will be able to feed their chicks because not all species, again, there's so many varieties of birds, um, we always think of the female just sitting on the nest and waiting for the eggs to hatch. That's not necessarily true. A lot of species share that responsibility. Um, but it is true that when they have a lot of mouths to feed, one bird alone can't feed all those chicks. And so it's incredibly important that they find a mate that um, has those skills. So by the male doing that and bringing these gifts, it's, it's communication and it's symbolic of all of these different responsibilities that he's willing to take on and capable of taking on. We don't have necessarily the direct translation of that in the human society or in human societies, but I just really love that we share that with so many different other animals, including birds, this concept of gift bringing in courtship to show you're worth this sacrifice for me. And the institution of marriage in a traditional sense is also attempting to emulate birds because there are species of birds that do mate for life. These species are usually longer lived. A lot of the times they're raptors or corvids. They're species that um, are predatory. Songbirds tend not to mate for life because their lives are shorter and because they are protected predated upon so imagine if you're a chickadee and you made it for life and then your partner's killed within a month by a predator are you just gonna sit around and not contribute your genes to the next generation it's probably not best for your species so most smaller birds and again birds that are pre predated upon um don't mate for life and it's for a very practical reason but we do very much romanticize the birds that do mate for life because you know we feel like oh they're in love i would also love i feel like i'm using that word a lot this episode i would love to hear a paleontologist's take on this because as you likely know dinosaurs have survived as birds so there's every possibility that these courtship behaviors are that ancient. And if they're that ancient, if they originated with dinosaurs, how does that say anything about us? Does this concept of courtship, courtship and gift giving, is it like intrinsic to some forms of life? I don't know. I'm getting very philosophical here, but these are the things that I like to to think about. I may not have the answers to big, universal, deep questions like that. Maybe nobody does. But we can have a closer look at some of our more modern customs to do with Valentine's Day.
So the theory goes that out of these customs of drawing slips of paper with people's names on them, or mainly <laughs> women's names on them, um, has survived for many centuries in Europe. And there was a, a tradition in many different European villages where the names of the young men and women were written onto um, slips of paper. I should correct that statement, say single young men and single young women. And these strips of paper or slips of paper would be drawn by the participants, taken home, and dreamed upon. And it was considered a very excited, merry affair. And I'm sure it's full of a lot of giggling and a lot of hopes that you draw a certain name from a certain someone. Um, at the very least, this custom probably served as a great icebreaker um, to help people make introductions and start talking. And they say that some of these matches became proper courtships and then led to the exchanging of love letters. Before greeting cards became such a mass-produced commodity, which happened probably in the Victorian era, um, young men were expected to craft their own tokens of affection. And there were actually books and stencils to help inspire them, to help guide their artwork, and to give them ideas and full-blown verses that they could copy onto their love letter or token of affection. Um, again, we can very clearly see how this survives in our modern custom of Valentine's Day cards. In fact, if you go and start perusing some of these cards, you'll see this theme uh, that we've been exploring, that it will be flowers, because flowers are a symbol of fertility. It will be birds. It will be um, red. It will be pink. It'll be a lot of the imagery that we've been exploring and seeing how ancient and deep some of the symbolic roots are of these images. And we just don't think of that. Um, teddy bears, teddy bears can be thrown into that lot too, because they're something that we get you know, quasi-paternal about. We cuddle them as if we would cuddle an infant. And so there's that link to tenderness, to love, and again, to reproduction. And I do still love how, again, this isn't just inherent to human cultures, um, but that we do see it very much in the aviary world, or the avian world, rather. Um, we even have the term lovebirds, we call people lovebirds. So there is a very strong link between human romance and uh, not only the practices, and I'll just say culture, the culture of birds, but how we view them and the lens through which we view them and the meaning we ascribe to them. For example, doves have long been seen as a symbol of love and of peace in the bible they are associated with peace um before that they were often seen in depictions of aphrodite the ancient greek goddess of love so i think it's because again birds are very observable most of us have an opportunity to at least look at pigeons, if not look at starlings and other birds that, I won't say lose their fear of human but humans, but get very used to picking out which humans are dangerous and which ones of us aren't. Um, and so because they're so prevalent and because we can observe them and we can see them, whether we live in the countryside or whether we live in farmland or whether we live in a city, um, it makes sense to me that we would be quite aware of how they behave and then want to assign symbology to them and incorporate them into our worldview. So as I'm wrapping up, I do want to add um, 
one last bit of information here on the month in which we celebrate St. Valentine's Day, right? That's February. Why is it called February? Apparently, well, there's several different schools of thought on this, but apparently February comes from Februarius, which was named after the ancient Roman festival called Februalia. Februalia. This is, you know, I was raised with English as my first language. I have no excuses. There are no excuses. But Februa is a word. Februa is a word I can say. I can pronounce Februa. So Februa means to cleanse in Latin. And the festival of Februalia, which occurred during this month was likely very linked to Lupercalia, if not a different iteration of the same thing. Uh, and it was had a focus on prayers and atonement and purification. We don't know exactly why it was a festival. It could have been in honor of the Italic god Februus, who was a god of purification, often associated with death. And with riches, he was considered a god of the lower world and probably later morphed into Pluto, the god of the underworld, um, or Hades. And the cleansing nature of this time of year quite likely has to do with the changes seen in nature, especially around the Mediterranean. Snow would be beginning to melt, the spring struggles to emerge, and winter seems to, to quite literally wash away. It's also possible that Februus became associated with Febris, the Roman goddess of fevers. So you can hear the similarities in those words and how our word in English is borrowing from Latin, like many of our words do. Um, and fevers are themselves a form of purification, even though we don't think of them that way. We think of them as a form of illness or a sign of illness. But if you imagine the process, the biological process of what's going on, your fever is more or less, I'm using air quotes here, cooking <laughs> Of the, a virus out. It's making your body an inhospitable environment for that invader, for that intruder, for that virus. And as uh, when a fever breaks, right, there's a lot of sweating. So a fever reaches, again, fever pitch. <laughs> a fever reaches its crescendo, turns the tide of the war inside of you, and then you are drenched in sweat. So from the outside, once you've turned to that corner and you are hopefully going to start getting better, people observed that you would be drenched in sweat, drenched in this clear liquid. So it's like your fever purified you. It purified your, your body from this illness. It's also possible that there is a link to a goddess, Juno Februata, who was seen as a patron goddess of women and of marriage. And she was also honored by a festival at this time. And I'm mentioning all of these different lenses through which to view this, these different angles, um, because we don't know which one is true because there is no such thing as truth in this, this type of scholasticism. These all could be true at different times and in different places. And... As I said in the opening, um, these the way these customs work and move through human societies is uh, very nebulous and very much like a spider's web. And uh, so I think it is the most beneficial to just look at the evidence that we do have and to um, see the patterns, if there are some, as they arise, and try to just stick with them as patterns. So I hope I haven't left you with the impression that we that Valentine's Day began before ancient Greece and you can trace it all the way up through modern Valentine's Day. Um, hopefully you have an impression 
that there have been customs and rituals and celebrations and festivals circling more or less around the same themes or similar themes, and they've taken on many different iterations and shapes throughout the years. Um, again, my goal is usually not to ever try to impart unless we really feel like we can say with veracity that we can trace the thread of these customs throughout history to specific instances. Um, it's usually more the case that there's borrowing here and lending there and sometimes outright hijacking. Um, and that's, that's fine. All of it's fine. It's all a wonderful, splendid mess. I mean, who doesn't want more celebrations in their life except for ones that involve being slapped by a bloody piece of a goat. So on that note, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> but in all seriousness, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please, please, please give this podcast a like and a follow it on whatever platform you happen to be listening to it on. It's very new, and I am hoping, hoping, hoping to grow my listenership. I really appreciate all of your support, and of course... If someone comes to mind who you think would also enjoy hearing this episode, don't hesitate to share it. And also you can find me on social media if you want to keep up not only with this podcast, but other things that I'm doing. Um, my main haunt is Instagram. I'm on Instagram as Wild Authoress. And of course, there is my main website where you can find links to pretty much everything. I also would love to thank my patrons. I am so indebted to you for your dedication and your support. And if you want to have a bit of sway and influence on this podcast, please do check out the various benefits. Uh, for the or old lore tier, you have um, the ability to suggest topics for me to talk about on this podcast. But I do also want to reiterate that Patreon now has a wonderful option um, that you can sign in and register and follow me for free. So you don't have to pay anything. And I do upload uh, these episodes there because there is an opportunity for you to leave comments and we can engage a bit more in that way because that's where it's fun, building community and actually having a conversation rather than me just talking into the void and... Hopefully you're not listening in a void. I really hope not. Well, this Valentine's Day episode has started dark and is staying dark. So thank you very much, dear listener, for tolerating my bad jokes and my quirks and mispronunciations. We'll get there in the end, won't we? <laughs> Until next time. May your hearth be warm and your heart be full. Mm -hmm.